Hello, welcome. Uh, in this lecture video, we are going to look at systems of two or more masses, and now we're going to add in friction. Uh, and we're going to use the same method that we used when we were dealing with outward machines before. To find the acceleration of the system, we are going to look at the net force acting on the system as a whole. And if we're asked to find tension forces, we're going to look at, again, the net force just on one mass or the other. So in this system, we do have friction between uh, M1 and the table up here. Uh, so let's start with our free body diagrams. Uh, for M1, we have M1G going down, and we have a normal force going up. This time, the normal force does affect the motion because it's tied in with the force of friction. So there is a force of friction here. Uh, depending on the problem, this could be static friction, this could be kinetic friction, and we have a tension force in the rope over here. Uh, on M2, we have the weight going down, and we have the tension force going up. Remember, with Atwood style systems, we always describe the common positive direction for the system. So I'm going to say that is the positive direction. So for M1, to the right is positive, and for M2, down is positive. So the basic setup for the acceleration in the system uh, is, again, looking at the net force acting on the system. So we are going to have to consider the total mass of the system uh, and then times the acceleration. So filling things in with the correct directions, we have our friction force going negative. We have the tension on the upper block in the positive direction, tension on the lower block in the negative direction, and we have M2G acting in the positive direction. And that's going to be equal to the total mass times the acceleration. And like we've shown before using this method, we see that the tension forces cancel out as long as the pulley does not have mass, then that is true. Same rope, same tension. So now we are stuck with the following. M2G minus the friction force is equal to M1 plus M2 times A. Filling in the equation for friction, which is coefficient times the normal force, and understanding that the normal force is equal to the weight on M1, we get M2G minus the coefficient times M1G is equal to, let's go ahead and divide by the total mass, so we've got our acceleration, M1 plus M2, and that's going to equal the acceleration. So that's kind of the general setup. Um, depending on if it's static friction or uh, kinetic friction, a question with static friction could be, what is the minimum mass M2 required to get the system to move? In that case, our coefficient of friction in here is going to be the coefficient of static friction, and the acceleration is going to be 0, because we want that instant before the system starts to move. Uh, in which case M1 and M2 would go away. If this is kinetic friction, we'd be solving for the acceleration in the system. Our coefficient would be the coefficient of kinetic friction, and we'd be finding A. So we would be dividing by M1 plus M2 in that case. So that's the setup for something like that. Let's look at a slightly more complicated system involving friction. And I just messed something up. What did I do? Go away. So here we've got a system of two masses. And let's say that there is friction between the two box, boxes here, but there's no friction between M1 and the ground. That's the simpler case. And let's say that we're going to apply a force to the lower box, M1. Uh, and we want to know what is the acceleration of the system. First off, that's an easy question to answer because, well, first let's assume that M2 does not slide on M1, uh, in which case then we are going to again look at the net force acting on the system as a whole. That's going to equal the total mass of the system times the system's acceleration. And if M2 does not slide on M1, then that force of static friction acting on M2 cancels out with the Newton's third law pair, the force of static friction acting on M1, and we just have the applied force F is equal to the total mass times A. Let's do some free body diagrams here and show why that Newton's third law pair, where it is and 
and how it cancels out. So let's first do the top block, uh, M2. We have M2G going down. We have uh, the normal force, let's call this a contact force actually between, uh, between these two because there's going to be another Newton's third law pair between those. Uh, and we need to think about what direction static friction is acting on M2. Uh, M1 accelerates to the right, so does M2. If M2 is accelerating to the right, that means the force of static friction has to be acting to the right on that top block. There's nothing else that could be accelerating M2 to the right. So it's that force of static friction that causes M2 to speed up. Here we see a friction force that's actually speeding something up, doing positive work on something. So that's an interesting case. A free body diagram for M2 is going to be uh, its weight going down. The contact force from up here is going to be pushing down and it's going to be a Newton's third law pair, equal and opposite. And then there is a normal force here going up on this block. We're applying that force F to the right on the lower block, and here's where the Newton third law, Newton's third law pair with friction comes in. If friction's pushing M2 to the right, that means that same force of static friction is pushing M1 to the left. Uh, the reason M1 accelerates to the right is because F is bigger than the force of static friction between the two blocks. Uh, that is a Newton's third law pair, so this friction is exactly equal to that one. One really, really, really important thing to understand here is that both of these forces of static friction depend on this force right here. It's going to be the coefficient of static friction times that contact force. In essence, the normal force on just M2, not the normal force on M1. That has nothing to do with the friction between the two blocks. All right. So going back over here, if we just want the acceleration of the system and M2 does not slip on M1, then we see there here, let's just do it explicitly. Uh, up top, we have the positive force of static friction because it's going to the right. Uh, down on the bottom block, we have a negative force of static friction. Uh, and then we have this applied force, F. We see that those two friction forces, again, go away. And we just have the total mass times A. So like I said, it's pretty simple to find the acceleration of the system with that because the friction forces cancel out. A more interesting question would be, what is the minimum coefficient of static friction between the two blocks to get a known acceleration? Or we could flip that around and say, the coefficient of friction between the blocks is known what is the maximum acceleration uh, that we, can, uh, we would see? Or what is the maximum force F that we could apply to accelerate these to the right without M2 slipping? So let's see what that setup would look like. Uh, at this point, we kind of have to go to a two equations, two unknowns type of problem. So Newton's second law for the top block, we would have the net force acting on M2 is equal to just its mass, M2, times A. Uh, the force of friction on the top block is going to be the coefficient times the contact force here. And that's going to be uh, just M2 times G. So in essence, the normal force acting on the top block is equal to M2 times A. And here we get the masses cancel out. So mu times g is going to be equal to the acceleration for the top block. The bottom block, slightly more complicated. We have the applied force F acting to the right. We have static friction acting back to the left. And that's going to equal just its mass, m2, times a. Uh, sorry, this was m1. Bottom block, m1, yep. OK, so now filling this in, we have F is equal to, here's where it's really important to remember that first, these static friction forces are equal in magnitude, and second, that the static friction force depends on that contact force, not that normal force. So it's going to be the same, coefficient times M1G is equal to M2A. Uh, we see that the masses don't cancel out on the right-hand side. Um, we do have an equation over here that we could plug in for acceleration, uh, in which case we could solve for 
f, the maximum applied force for a given coefficient. We could solve for the coefficient necessary to push the blocks at force f without the blocks slipping. Uh, and we could even solve for the acceleration of the system with this two equations, two unknowns as well. All right, so some pretty important things to remember in terms of Newton's third law uh, with these. That's it for this one. We'll see you next time.